Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to the Insightful Thinkers podcast. This is Monday number three of the weekly episodes, and I hope you guys are enjoying them for all the uh, people who have been listening in so far. Thank you. And for the people who have been subscribed on YouTube Uh, today, in-depth analysis into neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is a um, common research topic in neuroscience research. Um, What is neuroplasticity? It is the property of cerebral neurons in the brain to change their structure and function in response to experience. So this is just the idea that the, uh, the brain... Is, is a dynamic structure rather than an immutable kind of thing that does not that does not change. And the brain that you're born with, that's the brain you get. And yes, it'll grow, but it's not going to change in result to experience. So, um, and that obviously is, is not the case. It does change. It is a dynamic structure. And we're going to talk about this and uh, how, how does it change in response to experience. The history of the idea of neuroplasticity. Um, obviously, we did not um, always know that this this was the case that the brain could change uh, as a result of experience. Um, but early ideas in neuroscience did kind of convey this this idea that memory formation involves the modification of synaptic connections. Um, these are connections in the brain where. Uh, signals are communicated through these this is at the synaptic junction between neurons and this idea that that uh changes can happen to the brain as a result of experience is more than 200 years old actually uh in the 1780s the swiss swiss naturalist charles benet and the italian anatomist michel vincenzo malacarne discussed the idea that mental exercise can induce brain growth uh, malacarne actually tested this idea by by taking pairs of dogs and birds and training one from each pair um, and just letting the other do whatever. And after dissecting these animals' brains, uh, Malakarn found that the trained animals actually had more folds in the brain than the untrained ones. And this was an interesting result showing that, huh, the, why is the brain of a trained animal different than the brain of an untrained animal? This is in actually even before the 1800s. So this is early early work into this. Um, and a hundred years later, uh, the philosopher Alexander Bain suggested that for every act of memory, every exercise of bodily aptitude, every habit, recollection, train of ideas, there is a specific grouping or coordination of sensation and movements by virtue of specific growths in the cell junctions. So this philosopher also had these similar ideas about this changing brain as a result of experience. Um, and, and the idea that behavior changes um, are produced from these biological changes in the brain. And this is kind of a materialist standpoint the materialist standpoint is a the common and uh, I believe dominant standpoint, especially in neuroscience, and it's the idea that matter is the fundamental substance in nature, and all things, including mental states and consciousness, are the result of material interactions. The materialist viewpoint says that um, whatever thoughts you have, whatever behaviors you have. Um, your consciousness itself, it's produced from a material brain and a material mind and changes in your brain are due or changes in, in your mind and your consciousness are from changes in your brain and nothing else. No type of soul, no type of other possible factor. It's coming from the brain. And that is the view in, in neuroscience and in actually in a lot of other fields as well, especially in science and philosophy well, consciousness is in itself is still a little bit of a mystery how uh, neural states can turn to subjective experience. And even the neuroscientists don't understand how that, uh, that occurs. And this is why in f- fields like philosophy, not everybody is a materialist. Because if the materialist viewpoint hasn't solved for consciousness itself, then how can we just say that every single conscious state is coming from the brain, right? But this is the the view 
uh, today. And this was the view from Alexander Bain, um, this idea that uh, behavior changes are produced due to biological changes in the brain. And specific growths and cell junctions occur after you get certain experiences. So these are, um, this is in the late 1800s. These are the ideas that were permeating and the ideas that were starting to take root. But oftentimes in science, there are these paradigm shifts. And even if uh, certain things have been believed for a long time, new discoveries totally shift the paradigm. And there's an interesting book on this. It's The Structure of Scientific Revolutions by, I believe, Thomas Kuhn. And I actually haven't read this book, but I've heard this is exactly what it talks about. And I'm going to read this book soon. And we're going to do an episode on these paradigm shifts in science, how they happen, because that is what people are saying he talks about in the book. Um, but this par- what, how did this paradigm shift in neuroscience happen to from this, how the brain is a dynamic structure all of a sudden to, no, the brain is not a dynamic structure. Um, well, in his 1913 book, the pioneering neuroscientist Santiago Ramon y Cajal stated that the neural pathways in the adult brain and spinal cord are something fixed, ended, and immutable. And this, <laughs> Santiago Ramon y Cajal, he discovered the neuron itself, and he made incredible advances in neuroscience. He's essentially the father of neuroscience. And someone, when someone like him says that out from all his discoveries, it can shift the way that other scientists think of the brain. So he, th- he thought that it was fixed and it cannot be changed. And this was in the early 1900s now that... Um, now this becomes the new idea in the field. Uh, and this conclusion be- came to be widely accepted. And before long, the idea that the adult mammalian brain does not create new cells became a central dogma of neuroscience for the longest time. And it, it, this was the point when most researchers uh, agreed that while vast amounts of neurons and glial cells, glial cells are supporting cells for neurons in the brain, are generated during development, this process ends in the period just after birth. So yes, there's a little bit of change, but just after birth, that's it. Your brain is no longer going to change. And this became the dogma in neuroscience. Um, for instance, there's a quote, we are born with all the brain cells we will ever have. And that those that are lost through injury or disease can never be replaced. This was the idea in the field in the early 1900s. When did it shift back to this idea that was proposed 200 years ago, that was discussed by philosophers that the brain can change due to experience. And this came by way of environmental enrichment findings. Um, What is environmental enrichment? Enhanced stimulation of the brain, environmental enrichment um, can be defined as enhanced stimulation of the brain by ameliorated physical and social surroundings. Brains in richer, more stimulating environments have higher rates of synaptogenesis, more complex dendrite arbors, and enhanced brain activity. So environmental enrichment is essentially is similar to what happened with those early results where one dog was trained and one was not, and one bird was trained and one was not. The trained dog or the trained bird would be in the environmentally enriched condition, whereas the untrained bird or the untrained dog would be in the uh, deprived condition. And these environmental enrichment findings reemerged with Donald Hebb. He's the pioneering... um, a uh, Canadian psychologist, actually. And what he noticed was that he well, he actually did a funny experiment, an informal one, actually. But Hebb noticed that the rats he took home as pets for his children outperformed the other rats on problem-solving tasks when they were returned back to the lab several weeks later. And this seemed to show that early experience can have a dramatic and permanent effect on brain development and function. These were this, this was the reemergence of these neuroplasticity findings. And Hebb reported these findings actually in his 1949 book, The Organization of Behavior, where he concluded that 
The richer the experience of the pet group, the better they were able to profit by new experience at maturity. One of the characteristics of the intelligent human being. So he, Heb here, he, he likens this enhanced adaptability of the mind in enriched rats to, to the intelligent human being. When you get more stimulation and uh, more learning and more training and more experience with um, other rats and you're put in more social situations like the rats that he took home, you, in, in a way, almost your intelligence increases, he's kind of saying. So it seems that this increased, these increased problem solving skills um, are acquired if you have an adequately stimulating environment as opposed to um, an inadequately stimulating environment. Following these results was Rosenweig and a team of researchers in 1962, and they followed with some more formal experiments and had conducted his own formal experiments, but Rosenweig and, and researchers in 62 um, made some great findings on enrichment as well. What they did was they allowed some rats to live in larger housing than the standard laboratory housing and allowed these enriched rats to experience social interaction and interact with a variety of objects. So they created this enrichment paradigm with more objects and more social stimulation and larger housing and gave some rats an enriched environment. And what they found was that, kind of similar to what Heb found, rats that experienced this environmental enrichment had heavier brains than regularly housed rats, suggesting that the enriched experience had in fact caused neuro neuroanatomical changes. So these were some formal studies that really uh, perpetuated this new idea in, in neuroscience that the brain can change due to experience. And if you give organisms enhanced stimulation or the, the correct level of stimulation, then their brain will change for the better. Um, now, this paradigm, this um, environmental enrichment paradigm has persisted in neuroscience till this day, and researchers still conduct these types of experiments. But one thing in science you'll find is that there's always going to be critique of no matter what paradigm you're using, even if it's the central dogma in the field, people are always trying to challenge this. And uh, no matter what discovery is made, Einstein's findings were not without uh, critique and people trying to break it down and find different things. But it's all about uh, um, experiments be getting replicated. It's not about one landmark study. When, when one landmark study does come out, what actually happens is that there are a lot of other studies that go against this study and seem to support other hypotheses and then uh, people contradict and there are detractors to this landmark study but what happens is that people also try to replicate the landmark study and then they find similar results and then people try to replicate the experiments of the detractors and they can't find what the detractors found and this is how um, paradigms get strengthened in science and theories i should say get strengthened in science um, but all this to say that in science, there's always going to be critique, even of um, well-established research paradigms, including environmental enrichment paradigms. So the issue proposed by detractors these days is that is can laboratory enriched settings in any way actually be considered a, a truly enriched naturalistic environment? Because even the studies of Rosenweig and colleagues and things like this the rat in the end is still living in a cage or in a box. So, I mean, is the, yeah, you can put social factors. Yeah. You can give them a larger area and yeah, you can do this and that, but is that really an enriched environment in the end compared to where they actually live in the wild? Um, surely the rats that live in a fully naturalistic environment in the wild, um, will, will experience the greatest, uh, most salubrious effects in their in their brain compared to even the so-called enriched environments that researchers put them th put them through. So while attempting to address this issue, a Berkeley group of researchers found that uh, laboratory rats living in a semi-naturalistic outdoor setting for one month had greater cortical development than their littermates reared in these so-called enriched laboratory cages. The semi-naturalistic setting um, is essentially the naturalistic setting, but they, they, uh, as far as I know with this study, they tag um, kind of these, these um, 
these rats and then they bring them back so they put some rats in a truly enriched setting in the in the wild in a semi-naturalistic setting and they compare those to these enriched uh rats and they find that even enriched rats aren't actually so enriched um maybe the maximal brain development happens in the wild in the first place um and this kind of suggests that uh as i mentioned even enriched environments may still be relatively impoverished with respect to wildlife conditions and that plasticity in response to stimulation does not reach saturation in a typical environmental enrichment setting so yes there are benefits to living in this enriched environment but you don't see the maximal benefits to brain plasticity because they're not actually in a fully enriched naturalistic environment. So this is just the beauty of research, you guys. There's a caveat to every result, and you're really forced to examine even the most effective paradigms from every single angle. And you have to be able to point out flaws, even of your own research, in an incredibly unbiased fashion. And as soon as you exhibit... Uh, experimenter bias and things like this, which are hard to um, avoid. But as soon as you uh, bring your biases in, you are you can't be a credible scientist. So you have to really try to leave your, your biases and preconceptions about uh, the way the study will go aside. Um, another approach to neuroplasticity studies, we've discussed this environmental enrichment paradigm, but another approach is sensory deprivation experiments. So these are almost the opposite of uh, neuroplasticity studies because this is where you deprive an animal and then you see the changes that happen there. Um, that's another interesting thing about research actually is that um, the same exact thing can be studied in so many different ways. And this is another way that neuroplasticity has been studied. Um, Hubel and Weasel. I've mentioned these guys in a few episodes. And when you're, when you are, uh, landmark researchers, you are going to be mentioned in a lot of different areas because that's what good research is. Good research can apply to a lot of different fields and areas. And, uh, David Hubel and Torsten Weasel did these monocular deprivation studies. So what is this? So this is where they covered one eye of a cat in the early critical period and left one eye open. And then they checked what happened in the brain afterwards. So what they found was that after occluding one eye of a kitten during the critical period of development, a critical period is this window of time when an organism must learn an ability if it's going to learn it at all. So if it doesn't learn an ability in this critical period, it will never learn the ability. Um, so what they found was that after including one eye of a kitten during this critical period, there was a reduction in the number of cortical neurons responding to that eye in the brain. So there wasn't as much stimulation going in um, for that eye. So neurons no longer responded to stimulation for that eye and the brain simply changed as a result of experience. Inputs from the left and right eyes, what they do is they converge in the primary visual cortex and they actually compete for space there. So both your eyes with the inputs that go, they go to the back of the brain in the, in the visual cortex and you need stimulate equal stimulation from both eyes to create an equally mapped out, uh, V1, uh, cortex v1 area in the visual cortex so what happened was that the areas in the brain that would normally receive inputs from the closed eye failed to develop whereas those receiving inputs from the open eye grew to be far larger than they should there was a skew of um how much the brain responded to one eye rather than the other so in some you guys these these were just some of the landmark experiments to show that the brain can change as a result of experience. And this was a fact that always amazed me when I um, started learning uh, about neuroscience and things like this, because I initially just didn't understand that the brain could really change as a result of experience. Um, but as soon as I learned about uh, cases of, uh, for instance, Phineas Gage, where he was working on a railway and a pipe actually got thro shot through his prefrontal cortex and he became a totally different person. And 
these are just uh, things to show that when things happen to the brain or experiences happen, your mind changes. So these were, were always kind of interesting to me. And we are now doing an episode on uh, neuroplasticity because the, the brain is not a, an immutable structure. And if with the, with the right stimulation and the right learning, you can become a totally different person if you, uh, if you allow yourself to be put in different situations. And we're going to talk about how when you acquire different skills and, for instance, um, there's like golfing or navigation, then your brain actually becomes better at those things. And you become, if you play sports, then you become more coordinated. And there are caveats to those studies as well. And we'll discuss all of this in a second. But um, just the idea that uh, your brain is, it's not... The brain you're born with is is not the brain that you you end with. You, um, your experiences modulate the neurons uh, in your brain. What is the real world application of these environmental enrichment studies, though, that we discussed um, right before discussing the Hubel and Weasel studies? Well, um, there's there's a real world application for poverty. And, and low socioeconomic status. So what is socioeconomic status? It's the economic, occupational, and educational factors which influence a family's position in society. Um, so when you're of low socioeconomic status, you have a relative deficiency of income, education, goods, and other social factors. And how can this change the brain? How can a negative life experience change your brain for the worse? Well, socioeconomic status has been found to be associated with variations in the makeup and function of certain brain structures. More specifically, children from poorer backgrounds have smaller gray matter volumes uh, in the hippocampus, brain area implicated in memory, and they exhibit differences in amygdala and prefrontal cortex activity in comparison to those who are better off. The amygdala is implicated in a lot of your emotions and and fear and anger and and things like this, and the prefrontal cortex is involved in planning um, and kind of higher order thinking and logical thought. And if you're growing up in a poorer background, it's shown that you have deficits in these brain areas. So just uh, growing up in a worse environment can totally even change the decisions you make and can put you into uh, worse positions later in life. And this is what people have to realize. Um, So just like these studies are kind of... um, kind of groundbreaking there are also caveats though and and even though yes there are results that low socioeconomic status can affect your brain we have to realize that socioeconomics these are first of all only correlational studies and socioeconomic status is such a complex term so these brain scanning studies that find lower gray matter volumes in in individuals of low socioeconomic status, they reveal only associations rather than causal relationships uh, between poverty and brain structure and function. Socioeconomic status is it's a complex notion that usually incorporates an individual's level of education, income, occupation, stress levels, and nutrition, all of which have a dramatic effect on brain development. When there are so many factors, it's hard to pinpoint, oh, poverty, uh, you get bad brain development. It's not as simple as that because it might you might just have had bad nutrition and that's why your brain wasn't able to develop. It wasn't just because you grew up in this uh, bad neighborhood. So there are so many factors that go into this and um, more research is going to be required to fully determine the effects of socioeconomic status on brain development. Um, so just, yeah, the idea that it's impossible to determine exactly which components might be influencing brain development. So always remember when you, and this can go for anything that you read, but when you read research studies or when you read one piece of information, you always have to take it with a grain of salt because there's always going to be some conflicting, uh, whether it's a study or some kind of conflicting information to go against what you are reading. So you just have to... Uh, Remain logical, remain unbiased with what you're taking in and try to take uh, take whatever truths or results that you find um, with some kind of uh, 
for with some kind of extra thought and with a grain of salt and this is how it works in research um what are some other factors that change the brain we've discussed socioeconomic status we've discussed environmental enrichment we've discussed how the brain can negatively be affected due to sensory deprivation um, but let's discuss some other things so physical activity and other learning tasks seem to enhance proliferation of neural stem cells and in some cases even promote the survival of newborn neurons whereas stress certain types of inflammation and sensory deprivation have the opposite effect as we mentioned so when rats for instance learn complex motor skills um and they really take this this uh great stimulation into their brain, uh, structural changes actually occur in the motor region of the cerebral cortex and in the cerebellum. And the cerebellum is a structure that coordinates motor activity. So learning, again, seems to create a new pattern of organization in the brain. Experts also who have mastered specific skills and abilities have shown to have similar alterations in the associated brain region with whatever they're learning. So such effects... Uh, as these have been observed in musicians, typists, taxi drivers, dancers, divers, handball players, golfers, endurance athletes, and martial artists. So it seems that when you put yourself through rigorous training, whatever field it may be, your brain becomes more adept at processing whatever you you have been learning and if you are an experienced martial artist then maybe regions in the cerebellum are are more greatly developed that coordinates motor activity and you just become a more coordinated person and you might already be thinking though of the caveats like we've been talking about though and there are caveats obviously to these things as well um these studies are purely correlational right um we cannot reject the possibility that differences observed in brain structures were pre-existing conditions that enabled individuals to pursue these activities better in the first place. So just like how I just mentioned, for, let's go with the example of the martial artist who you find, oh, wow, the martial artist has has greater um greater development in the cerebellum and their motor activity must be increased compared to controls and compared to normal people because they must have the martial arts they must have been doing has changed their brain right over time but no wait a minute maybe that martial artist already had uh, enhanced uh, development in this brain area and they were just born with differences there that made them more likely to even become a martial artist and become good at it so that they could even be a member of this study later into the future. So, so maybe they were already born with this difference and people who weren't born with these differences no longer were martial artists and they obviously could not be in this study in the first place. So again, guys, there's all, there are always researchers who uh, have to mention these things and have to mention that it is purely correlational. Um, but and 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 we can't just totally conclude things with correlational evidence only there's no causal relationship there you can get closer to a causal relationship if your correlation coefficient is a one that's full um full causation but correlationally it could be anywhere between this number could be zero and one between zero and one and you don't really know um if there's any causal relationship there at all this is the nature of these types of studies um so what, what's happening in most of these studies is that it involves recruiting small groups of experts and comparing the structure or function of their brains with those of amateurs or novices at this single point in time. And when you do this cross-sectional design, you can't conclusively establish whether any observed differences are the result of training or whether they re uh, they react anatomical or they reflect, excuse me, anatomical and genetic differences that were present at birth, kind of as I mentioned. And so, for instance, kind of as I talked about the martial artists, but you could also talk about musicians. So musicians with differences in certain brain areas, maybe they were born with certain differences in their brain that made them uh, become musicians and made them want to even pursue music in the first place and then hence end up as part of the study. Um, 
And so guys, determining if the brain really does change as a response to mastery of certain skills requires longitudinal studies in which members of each group have their brains scanned repeatedly over periods of months or years. You would need to take these musicians or take these martial artists, scan their brain at the start before they start vigorously practicing their skill, and then scan it afterwards when they become a master. Then you can see if the brain really is changing as a response to experience, rather than just taking a martial artist and then taking a normal person and then cross-sectionally examining both of them. You need to do these longitudinal studies. And studies on London taxi drivers by researchers at Imperial College London started to take advantage of these longitudinal studies. Um, to show how mental training can, in fact, induce anatomical changes in the brain. First, they did uh, a cross-sectional study, kind of like what we've been discussing, where you just compare uh, the expert with a control. And I'll talk about this one right now, and then we'll talk about how they followed up these results with longitudinal studies to confirm that, yes, the brain does change as a response to experience. This is an interesting study, one of the landmark ones in neuroplasticity. So to qualify as a London taxi driver, trainees must learn a labyrinth layout of some 26,000 streets, the location of thousands of landmarks, and also the quickest way to navigate between any two points in the city. There is a very rigorous training that goes into that that is needed b before you become a licensed London taxi driver. And uh, these studies by these researchers examine the differences between these taxi drivers and the general population. What were the results? Well, gray matter density of the posterior hippocampus, uh, the posterior hippocampus is a region in the brain known to be involved in spatial navigation, um, was found to be significantly larger in qualified London taxi drivers than in controls. And also, the more experienced of a driver you were, the larger the posterior hippocampus. So it seems that the more, it's like a use it or lose it situation where the more you put your brain through uh, through these things and you the force your posterior hippocampus to be used, the, the more powerful it actually gets in the end. Um, but... Let's go back to how this study was a cross-sectional one still. So the researchers could not rule out the possibility that the differences they'd observed were due to pre-existing anatomical differences, you guys. So for instance, maybe it was the case that people with bigger posterior hippocampi and, and already have a greater ability in spatial navigation are the ones who passed the exam and ended up becoming taxi drivers in the first place, right? So... How did these researchers resolve this possible issue? What they did was they went on to perform several follow-up studies that confirmed that the changes were in fact due to the prolonged and rigorous training regime uh, that it takes to become a taxi driver using longitudinal approaches. Um, so uh, this longitudinal approach was used from the time the training started. The longitudinal approach is basically studying changes in one population over time, kind of like what we mentioned with the martial artists who you would have to scan their brain before they start training and then after to see the relevant changes in the brain. So this is a really good strategy as a follow-up and a very smart design used by these researchers because you can actually finally see if the training to become a taxi driver in fact made changes to their brains over time. And this is a significant imp improvement, um, as you guys probably know by now, on the cross-sectional approach for, for studies such as these. Um, because this cross-sectional approach used first simply just compared taxi driver brains at one point in time and how they were different to normal people's. That is interesting and that's correlational evidence, but that is not so conclusive. Um, so in this study, those who completed the tests necessary to become London taxi drivers exhibited increases in gray matter density over time, but the hippocampi of those who failed did not show increases in gray matter density. So they started the scanning before the training, and then they did scanning after the training. And they found that if, if you became a taxi driver, you had more, um, 
gray matter uh, density increase in your brain over time. But if you failed, you, you didn't have as much increase. So there's some kind of a change happening over time as you're studying and rigorously training to become a London taxi driver. So these results indicate that experience does modulate the brain and that pre-existing differences in the brain are not what make taxi drivers taxi drivers and controls controls. More likely based on this study is that everyone, the brain is similar in the posterior hippocampus, but that area gets developed because of this rigorous training. Um, so this corresponds kind of with this use it or lose it idea in neuroplasticity that um, I'm kind of trying to convey, I guess, with this episode is that um, the more you use certain areas of the brain, the more stimulation areas get, the more training you go through, the better actually your brain gets at processing that type of information. So it can even be something as um, as seemingly meaningless as um, or as trivial, I guess you could say, as like as, as watching movies or analyzing a lot of movies. If you put yourself through, say, one movie a day for a year and you force yourself to analyze it and think critically, well, you just, after that year, you might even find that you have become more of a critical thinker just by way of putting yourself through the relevant experience. So if you choose your experiences wisely, you guys, you can actually become uh, kind of like that and you can become a critical thinker. You can start to analyze a little more. And this is what uh, I I kind of have found over the years as well, like as of, as I force myself to uh, learn different things and to think critically about things, I just naturally become a little bit more of a critical thinker. It's not due to some uh, um, pre-existing ability to analyze or whatever. No, no one really has, people do have different abilities, but nobody has abilities that are so uh, developed just at birth. It's it's experiences and these prodigies often they have a lot of very early experiences in whether it's sports or music or things like this that shape this extremely plastic brain as you're as you're little into some uh amazing machine that allows you to be uh, amazing at a uh, soccer or basketball or, or the violin or piano. It's because you started training at a very, very early age. It's not just, you're not just born with uh, a miraculous ability. You have to train it. Some people are born with a greater propensity to do certain things, but without the training, they are not going to reach the level that they could have. And it's because the training is what's changing your brain. Um, so kind of an application, I guess, to regular life, you guys. If you if you want to um, be something, sometimes you have to do it first, and then you will become become that thing you were looking to be. If you want to become the uh, uh, a very ambitious person or someone that doesn't give up. Well, sometimes you have to put your mind through that, say, if you want to run every day and you have to put your mind through that running every day first before it becomes habitual and before your mind gets harder and before your mind, uh, as David Goggins actually says, becomes more calloused. It doesn't just come out of thin air. You have to do sometimes do things to change your brain in the first place. Um, And I could go on and on with examples about you could do the same with reading and analyzing. Um, But let's. Let's conclude this episode soon. We're reaching that 45 minute mark we've been hitting recently. So uh, we'll talk about neuroplasticity in blind people just as a final uh, topic of of neuroplasticity research. So the visual cortex of, of early blind but not sighted subjects actually is activated during tasks of auditory localization. So verbal memory or braille reading in parallel with better performance with respects to sighted subjects. This is a big jumble of words all to say that usually the visual cortex responds to visual input. Right now I'm looking directly into the camera and my visual cortex if you if you were to put me in an fMRI machine, it would be lighting up right now because it's showing that uh, there's a lot of blood flowing to this area, and I'm using the visual cortex. In blind people, because they don't have the visual input to the visual cortex, auditory 
So when I hear myself speak, that actually lights up the visual cortex because the, the plasticity of the brain and your brain actually ends up using the visual cortex to respond to auditory stimuli, you guys. Um, how do we know that the visual cortex uh, is what it, what is implicated in um, like braille reading or auditory localization in blind people? Well, if visual cortex activity is disturbed by TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, we talked about this in, uh, oh my gosh, in ex machina. Um, yeah, we talked about this in ex machina analysis. So if the visual cortex activity is disturbed by transcranial magnetic stimulation, this is a way of stimulating the brain that can disturb visual areas, then performance deteriorates in blind but not sighted subjects in auditory tasks. So this shows that visual cortex activity is necessary for auditory localization in blind people. When you block off the ability to use this area of the brain, blind people have, have trouble with, with hearing because that just shows that their their visual cortex is being used to hear things. But when you block off the visual cortex in sighted people, they can hear just fine. And these are very interesting studies to, to show this idea that blind people actually use the visual cortex to process sound, this, this plastic change in the brain. And your brain is adapting to now... Uh, to use the visual cortex for some purpose because it's not being used for vision. So humans rely on these plastic changes in synaptic connectivity within and between cortical areas. The brain is incredibly plastic and is resilient, especially early in life as well. Your brain can reroute these um, signals like it does in blind people from so, uh, using uh, the temporal lobes for hearing, but now uh, using the visual cortex for hearing. And it can reroute a lot of inputs and your brain is very plastic and adaptable. It's a dynamic structure, you guys. It can change as a result of experience. And studies on recovery from brain damage show this, but especially in children, because when you age, your, your brain seems to actually go through changes in its ability to be plastic. And what you find is that when older individuals um, unfortunately have a stroke or have a terrible brain injury, they can't recover quite as well. Whereas if it's a younger person who even has a more severe injury, they can actually become almost just fine with almost no impairment. So the plasticity actually changes as you get older. Um, but either way, there is always some kind of uh, ability for the brain to change you guys. And how does this... <clears throat> How are the implications for this neuroplasticity research for the future? Well, there is something called optogenetics. We're going to close the episode with talking about this here. And this is essentially, uh, optogenetics is a method that allows for the control of neuronal activity through genetic engineering. Uh, again, might be uh, a little bit of a jumble of words there. So it allows for the control of neuronal activity. So it allows for the control of uh, activity in neurons. Neurons are what the brain uses to communicate and to sense signals. And it uses genetic engineering. Genetic engineering is a process where scientists uh, change the information in the genetic code of a living organism. So they're literally going into an organism and changing the inherent code that makes that organism. So in optogenetic studies, Scientists add a piece of genetic code to neurons that allows for neurons to respond to light. And um, they add this piece of genetic code um, called these opsins. Opsins were first discovered in algae. Algae uses opsins to help them move towards light. So algae have, this, have these things called opsins that allow them to respond to light. So when we put the genes for these opsins into neurons, it creates almost this hybrid effect so when we in introduce these light responsive genes to these neurons, now neurons become sensitive to light all of a sudden, whereas obviously neur neurons are not sensitive um, to, to direct light manipulation right now. But when you add these genes from uh, for like the algae, then it allows neurons to respond to light at the flick of a switch. So researchers uh, can switch cells on and off um, using using light, using changes in light. So 
essentially researchers basically what they're doing is they label the neurons that are active during memory formation and they can reactivate them with pulses of light so reactivation of the neurons that first responded when mice experienced fear leads to the retrieval of these fearful memories so if neurons if a, a rat or a mouse experiences a fearful situation a certain area in the brain will light up perhaps in the hippocampus that allows for memory of that fearful situation so the rat won't go into that situation again so they track which neurons lit up when the rat experienced fear or when the mouse experienced fear and then what they can do is they can put the mouse in a totally different environment and they can flip on excuse me these same neurons and the rat will experience fear all of a sudden just because it manip uh the researcher turned on the light switch or it's not it's not like a light switch it's actually something that goes right into the brain but essentially you can control the behavior of organisms through optogenetics so what scientists essentially have created is memory manipulation um optogenetics what they can do is they can even switch fearful memories into pleasant ones or vice versa and implant false fearful memories into the mouse brain so for instance researchers could activate the mouse amygdala which is an area that is active during fear in harmless situations or they can activate pleasure circuits in what should be a fearful situation they could put even a cat right next to the mouse these are the kind of future implications next to the mouse and if you activate the pleasure circuits the mice the mouse with the rat might just be completely fine and not fearful at all they can totally manipulate the behavior using these optogenetics this is mind-boggling stuff um incredible stuff in neuroscience and uh these are just the kind of these are on the we're on the frontiers of this technology really how does this apply to neuroplasticity though well if we can constantly trigger positive feelings in people, even in situations where they are usually fearful or anxious, their brains could eventually produce these positive feelings on their own. Kind of like uh, what these experiments have shown, where if you put your brain through certain experiences over and over, like the martial artist or the musician or the taxi driver, these areas in your brain can get strengthened in response to that type of experience. So if you can stimulate these uh, uh, circuits for positivity and things like this then eventually that brain area inherently becomes stronger and then it no longer requires experimental manipulation for you to just automatically feel those feelings just like martial artists after so much training they can do all sorts of different um sequences and they just know exactly what to do without even thinking twice whereas at first their brain is not trained to be able to do that yet so they have to really think about oh, what move do i do now what guard do i put up now and things like this if you put your brain through a certain experience over and over and in the case of optogenetics if you stimulate this these positive uh circuits over and over then eventually naturally that will just come for individuals who are initially uh, depressed or anxious and these are just in this future research for optogenetics it's a burgeoning field in neuroscience and uh, there are going to be a lot of breakthroughs here and maybe we'll pick back up on some of them way down the road decade down the road maybe we'll do a uh, do an optogenetics episode or or a review of what uh, researchers have been able to do with optogenetics you guys that's the episode neuroplasticity i hope i did it some justice for any uh, actual neuroscientist who ever watches this too even someone who doesn't uh hardly even knows what a neuron is i hope either way it did the topic some type of justice and it was able to be understood by whoever was watching um thank you guys for listening in uh, monday number three of weekly episodes and it's feeling great to get going, get going early, get something set up. And uh, it just, uh, I'm liking the way it's, it starts off my week for sure. I hope it is um, adding something to your week as well, you guys, for whoever's listening and watching. If you like this episode, as always, please share it with at least one person. If you know someone who uh, likes neuroscience stuff or just like science stuff, please share it with them. Just one person is plenty, you guys. Um, 
you can also subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you're listening on. So whether it's Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, anywhere else you listen to podcasts, Apple Podcasts allows you to leave a rating and a review and YouTube allows you to like the video and dislike it if uh, <laughs> if you are one of those neuroscientists who found that uh, I did not do the topic justice. And and along with the dislike, also comment and, and let me know... Um, different things that I, I may have gotten wrong or that could have added to this episode and this um, analysis into uh, how neuroplasticity works. And to do this, you can you can share um, using the Connect page and you can use the YouTube comments section as well. And if you are on the website, you can check out the blog posts on there, some poems, some articles, and uh, feel free to, to check that out whenever you'd like, guys. If you want to join the monthly ITP video conference call, you can also support the podcast on Patreon. But in the end, you guys, whatever you do to support, whether it's listening or watching, that's always good enough, even if you don't do any of those things. Thank you for tuning in to the Insightful Thinkers podcast, everybody. And we'll be back next Monday morning for more in-depth analysis into a diverse set of topics. Take care, everybody.